Warning, the Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Sourdough. My co-host, the one and only Man One, is on assignment. Boy, do we have an outstanding and surprising guest for you guys today. Scott Hoseman is the founder of Inquest Consulting in Chicago, where he helps organizations and teams create more empathetic and inclusive cultures. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. An inclusion consultant like Scott may seem... To be an unlikely guest for an arts podcast like us, but hey man, we're living in unlikely times. So many people feel angry, disrespected, and vulnerable. So I asked Scott to come on the show to help me understand why we just can't all get along. My hope is that by talking to Scott, he might help me and you better understand the challenges we all face towards becoming a more equitable society. As you'll hear, Scott is doing important work on the front lines of business helping organizations like Toyota and Bear help to embrace and communicate about individual and cultural differences in a way that is healthy, effective, and productive. But before we get into this powerful conversation, I just want to thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Not Real Art Podcast. We do this for you. We're here for you. Without you, it wouldn't make a difference. Please be sure to like and share this episode and subscribe to the podcast today. We always have world-class creatives who are top in their field, sharing their invaluable experience and advice. So you definitely don't want to miss out. And by subscribing to the podcast, you'll get alerts when new episodes drop every Tuesday morning. So you'll be sure not to miss out. Also, be sure to go to our website, notrealart.com, to sign up for our newsletter, to stay informed about all the cool stuff we do for artists and art lovers here at Not Real Art by visiting our website, You get access to free educational videos. You can sign up for our 2021 artist grants for the chance to win $2,000. You can buy affordable, original, contemporary art through our partnership with Sugar Press. And you can even support us through Patreon. And we'd be so grateful. Now, like I was saying, today's show is unusual, but it's great. Our guest, Scott Hoseman, is a renowned inclusion expert who works around the world helping people like you and me who are very different better understand and respect each other so that we might all get along and create a more equitable world. Now, let me warn you, this is an important and sometimes awkward conversation. I probably say some things that aren't so PC, but thankfully, we have the founder of Inquest Consulting here today to help us find our common humanity. So without further ado, let's get into this and hear from the one and only Scott Hoseman. Scott Hoseman, welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast. It's excellent to be here, Scott. Thank you. Man, it's great to have you here. Are you a podcast fan? Do you listen to podcasts at all? I have to say that COVID has really helped introduce me to this wonderful world of podcasts that I hadn't necessarily, truth be told, explored as deeply as perhaps I should have before that. You're a busy guy, man. You don't have time to listen to podcasts. (laughs) It's like now you have time, right? Well, need to take time to listen to it because there's some sure, great sure. content and information out there. And it's a, just another outlet for us to learn and grow and connect as people. So love it. What have you been listening to? I ask because, fun fact, by some estimates, there are 1.8 million podcasts out there. So people are saturated. Uh, finding the good ones is very hard. And so I like to ask our guests what they're listening to because, you know, maybe somebody will want to check in with it. I have to put a plug in for The Delicious Truth with Gloria Cotton. We've worked together for 23 years in this space, and she just really brings her power, as she says, The Delicious Truth to some really tough topics that are in enlightened and engaging ways that are are, are just great. So that's one that I'm enjoying now. Oh, that's great. Well, shout out to Delicious Truth. I want to check that out as well. Great name. Yeah, right? (laughs) Well, so have you ever been a guest on a podcast before? 
I have been. I've been a guest on a couple, and you're oh, – yeah, and I'm not going to remember their names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. A shout out to those that we respect but can't remember. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so Scott, you're an expert, renowned in demand expert on inclusion, helping organizations integrate inclusion into and in the values of inclusion into their companies, into their teams. I got to ask you, why can't we all just get along? Why is that so hard? <laughs> It's a great question, right? So it makes me think of that, uh, the, the great book of everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten, right? About why, why can't we? I saw Robert speak at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra Hall on Michigan Avenue. And of course, at the end, this was in 1990 or something, right? It's a long time ago when that book came out. And at the end, he of course, wanted to sign books, but he couldn't really sign books because there were way too many people there. And what he did was so clever. He had an ink pad and he just put a thumbprint on every title page of, <laughs> of the book. So I have a, a I have a thumbprint, which uh, may or may not be a good thing for him. Now, I don't know <laughs> whatever happened to him, but that was a great book. And that's right, man. I mean, some of these things are so basic and elementary in so many ways, but we grow up and they get complicated. But I mean, why is it so hard for us just to get along? Well, because it is, I believe, part of the human experience to have points of views and perspectives and our quote unquote tribes, if you will. And that's very much deeply ingrained learned behavior. If you talk to anthropologists, they'll tell you, hey, this is because this is how we've always been. And I think the power that we need to to think about is just because it's always been this way as smart thinking collective humans, how can we break some of those paradigms? So why can't we get along? It's part of the human experience, but it also means we need to lean into getting along as part of the human experience, in my view. Right. Well, and the threats have changed in many ways, right? Back in our DNA, right, as we evolved, right, we were trying to protect ourselves from other other wild animals or the other village or the other whatever. And those instincts are still inside, still in us. Well, this place of, of scarcity and fear drives a lot of why we don't get along. We feel that there's limited resources, limited opportunity, limited money, limited jobs, limited, and therefore we must go into a protectionist mode or territorialism to protect those things. And um, we don't view at Inquest, we don't view inclusion as pie. <laughs> it's not like there's just this limited amount of it. You know, we often help folks try to come to the grips with because we're looking and trying to include others or bring others into the inclusion tent. It doesn't mean we have to kick other people out. It doesn't mean we have to exclude to include. And at least that's our fundamental view. But this notion of fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what we don't understand, what we've not been exposed to before, what we know in our lives based on our worldview and the paradigms we've grown up with can create some myopic viewpoints. You mentioned Inquest, your firm. How long have you guys been around? We launched in 2011. So we are, okay. are coming up on our 10-year anniversary. Very excited. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Clearly, you're doing something right. You're offering real value for your clients. We hope, and we're proud of the work that we do, but also unsatisfied, to be honest with you. I don't think anybody in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion has it all figured out. And while we're proud of our work, there's so much more to do. And we work hard to raise the bar for ourselves every day and for our client partners. So what are some of the common themes? I mean, you do these workshops, you work with you know, do you do offsites and you even have the uh, proprietary product that you like to play? I'm forgetting the name of it, but you created, what's it called? I, I saw it on the website. Continuo. And that's awesome. I mean, it's a facilitate, right? A, a conversation and humanize, right? And I think that's part of what, you know, people are scared of being embarrassed or, you know, maybe being found out that they have this unconscious bias or whatever the case might be. But what are some of the common themes? I mean, you've done so many of these conferences and offsites and work with so many companies and teams over the years. When you look back and you think of whether it's Caucasian or African-American or Asian or whatever, you get these people coming into a room and having these tough conversations. Are there common themes that you see? And it'd be interesting to know that we're not alone. 
right? And I'm just wondering if there's some common themes you see. Well, I mean, some of the common themes are people are really fearful about saying or doing the wrong thing that offends this notion of being a PC culture, politically correct culture, I would argue hasn't served us really well, because what it's led us to do in a lot of our interactions is is clearly in our professional interactions is to not say anything or to avoid And that can be just as damaging and exclusionary as saying something just blatantly inappropriate. The impact on the receiving end can be really strong. And so we're hearing right now, in particular with regards to the social injustice since the the public execution of George Floyd, I mean, a lot of white folks saying, "I, I don't know what to do, what to say. I may want to, I have a desire, but I'm really fearful. And it creates an inaction. So that's one theme we're we're hearing and seeing a lot of. The other is this lack of muscle talking about real core dimensions of difference. And what I mean by that, a lot of us have been taught in professional settings that there are topics we just don't talk about. You know, we don't talk about religion. We don't talk about race. We don't talk about sex. We don't talk about politics. And we've got all of this, like these checklists of conversations we have to avoid. Well, therefore, we don't have practice talking about them with one another in professional settings. And so what it's led, in our view, is us to seek out people who believe and think a lot like we do, because that's where we maintain comfort. Yeah. So the safe, that's the safe place, the safe space, right? Absolutely. Our little clicks. And confirmation bias, right? That like, oh, I, I can connect with you because you think like I do, or you affirm the yeah. way I think. And when we talk about professional settings, when we talk about art and the work that you all do, pushing the envelope and creativity and pushing boundaries with art and learning, we're pushing the edges of that. It's not about conformity often in the art world. It's very different than that. Yeah. You referenced the, you didn't use this word, my word, but you sort of referenced the woke movement that we are going through right now and on the far left, especially. And it's interesting because I wonder to what extent that has helped or hurt the conversation because I know people my age, I'm 50, peers of mine who have a friend right now who's leaving her company after 20 years, because there is this internal revolution going on between the younger, the 20 somethings and the 50 somethings. And believe me, my friend is one of the most liberal, open minded people that you would ever meet, but not enough for this 25 year old (laughs) in the company who's really beating a drum around these issues, and they don't want to talk. They're talking past each other, maybe. I don't know. And so there's this exodus that's happening at that organization. I mean, are you seeing this play out as well among your clients? I mean, what say you about the woke movement vis-a-vis helping to drive real progress? Well, my hope is that it does drive progress because we're having conversations now. I've been in this space, in this field for 23 years, Scott, and I we have not seen the depth and breadth of conversations and desire for organizations to do more and be better on these topics in three years. So I'm hopeful that this is a sign of progress, that this is a step forward, but I'm also not naive to the fact that there's going to be some backlash, if you will, or there's going to be some negative consequences as we work to try to step forward. And I think if we go into this, that it has to be that perfection is the goal, right? I think we've lost from the very beginning, especially when we don't have examples of a clear path forward navigating some of these really tough issues. Right. That's a key point you're making. I mean, that what, what's that old saying about we don't want perfect to be the enemy of good? Like a lot of the stuff is incremental and it's messy and it's scary, but you got to get in there and, and, and roll up your sleeves. One of the most frequently asked questions that I get as a white male in this space these days from other Caucasians in our clients is I've got a black colleague or a Latinx colleague. I just don't I want to check in, but I don't know what to say. I don't want to get it wrong like we were talking about earlier. 
and I give them language and it's going to sound overly simplified, but I'm going to share it here just because it's been helpful to, to others is name your discomfort when you go into that conversation. And it can be as simple as, hey, I don't know even how to ask the question I'm getting ready to ask you or uncertain if I'm even going to get this right. I just know I need to check in with you. And can I do that? And right. naming the fact that we are uncomfortable and opening up ourselves to being a little vulnerable, what we're finding is can be the very door opener for a lot of richness on the other side. Well, you know, that's really interesting because of course, right? It's obviously hard, but simple, right? I'm reminded actually of a conversation that I had last night, in fact. You may or may not know this, but my kids are adopted and a friend of mine and his partner are considering adoption. And so he wanted to talk to me about adoption. So we had this great conversation last night and I was sort of talking about how our learnings and our understanding of adoption and what's healthy for not just the child, but for the families involved over the last 50 years has changed hugely. And the core point is transparency, honesty, openness about the adoption is far healthier for the child, for the family. It's not the taboo subject that it used to be. And they've got data now to prove that that was actually really damaging and toxic to keep it a secret. And so I don't know. So I'm just I'm listening to you and, and I'm reminded of that. And it's that old saying, sunlight's the best disinfectant, right? Like if you can just open up and and be vulnerable and honest about Hey, I'm concerned. I don't know what to say except that. Help me. Yeah, it's like, I don't know if you know, but for all 50 years of my life, I've been white. (laughs) Oh, okay. Uh, I thought you were using a whitening cream, but. Right. No, I, I, so I don't, that's my experience. There is no way I am going to understand or be able to change my paradigm in 50 years of those experiences. So if I desire to have these conversations and desire to have some learning and connection with others who may not be like me, how do I create safety for them and me in those conversations? It means I need to maybe lean in a little differently without the other caveat, without making people feel like it's their burden to educate me along the way. (laughs) Right. Right. And I think that's also an important boundary there to set of of saying, hey, if you're comfortable or I don't want to push you, I know I'm uncomfortable. I'd welcome these conversations if you would. Leaving the door open to get some feedback, I think, can be a great technique and see where it goes. Yeah. You've consulted all over the country, I'm guessing. Are issues related to inclusion and, and dare I say diversity? Well, how might these issues related to inclusion and diversity differ or do they differ from region to region? And and obviously, maybe from obviously in urban areas to rural areas. I mean, how have you managed that and what have you witnessed or seen in terms of how these issues might be different in terms of the actual location? They're vastly different and we work globally. So prior to COVID, 40% of my time was spent outside of the U.S. working organizations. Uh, No more frequent flyer miles uh, for you uh, right now, Scott. Yeah, none, none, (laughs) right? But context is everything. Even if you take a look at the same organization from a facility in one state to a facility in another, headquarters to a plant facility or, you know, one of their field offices, markedly different cultures, and this notion that we we can think about diversity, equity, and, and inclusion as a one-size-fits-all is problematic because the issues are varied. Pick any dimension of difference, sexual orientation and gender identity, disability or veteran status and you know, military background, race, ethnicity, name any dimension of difference, socioeconomic background, educational levels of attainment. There are circumstances that these are viewed very differently, in versus out cultures, insiders, outsiders, around a whole host of factors. So it plays out markedly different depending on where you are. That totally makes sense. I mean, what do I know, right? I'm just a guy. But in terms of my personal experience, I feel like, boy, if we could just empower people to travel (laughs) If we could get people in the same room together one way or another and figure out a way for them to see each other's humanity. Mm -hmm. The power of proximity. 
right? And sharing our human stories with one another goes a, a long way to building bridges versus creating those barriers that we build between us, those walls that we literally and figuratively build between us. That notion of getting to know. And then it ripples, though, beyond just the, oh, some of my best friends are, or I have a yeah. fill in totally. the blank. <laughs> right, right. That, that, that's not, I want to be careful, that's not what we're talking about there, and I, nor, nor do I think that's what you're implying. But this notion of understanding others' experiences, it matters. I know the way I think, the way my brain works and processes differences. So, Scott, I don't know if your listeners know, but we grew up in a very similar community, right? Yeah, that's right. We've known each other a long time. We've known each other for a long time. And the level of diversity that I was exposed to, broadly speaking, growing up was very, very limited. I know that I am wired differently today because of my travels, um, not only in the U.S., but globally. My brain is wired differently to process when I experience something that doesn't fit what I would quote unquote call the norm, but it's because of those experiences that have been re-imprinted on me. Yeah. And to be clear for our listeners, you and I do go way back. In fact, we actually went to high school together, grew up in the same town together. So let's use that as a context for a moment, because I know when, let's paint that picture a little bit. So specifically Northwest Indiana, Portage, Indiana, adjacent to Gary, Indiana, which was at that time, arguably the murder capital of the country per capita, at least through the 70s. It was a very segregated area. Blacks were in Gary. White people were not. But yet this is 40 miles outside the city of Chicago, which historically has always been very segregated. And so you and I graduated with some 600 people in our senior class, Portage High School, where we went, was the third largest school in the state at the time, as I recall. And yet we graduated with the majority of, of white kids. We had, you know, a handful of Latinos. We had even less African-American. And so here you and I are all these years later. Many of our friends have left. Many friends stayed. But even in the 80s, when we were growing up, for myself, just the way I was wired, I couldn't wait to get to Chicago and see and feel and smell and hear all these different cultures and ethnicities and things. Certainly, we both had friends that were like that in high school, but it's probably safe to say the majority of the kids that we grew up with didn't maybe have that inkling or have that curiosity. And so I hate to ask this question, but I mean, like, to what extent is this sort of hardwired, you know, this idea of openness or this idea of empathy or inclusion or, you know, I mean, obviously it can be learned, but I, I just wonder to what extent, you know, is it nature or nurture at all? This is going to be disappointing. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> Come on, um, man. All right. That's it. Show's over. <laughs> but I think it's both. I know for my experience growing up and coming to terms with my sexual orientation, growing up in the environment that you described as a gay man, a gay teen played a huge role in how I think about differences. I felt different in that environment. I felt like I did not fit in from my childhood. May I ask, Scott, I've never asked you this question. How old were you when you realized that you were gay? Realized I was gay. If I go back, I can remember knowing that I was markedly different in something in this regard as early as third grade. Third grade. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Did I know what that meant in terms of sexual orientation or was I having those thoughts? Absolutely not. But then that kind of solidified itself in high school and then coming out in college, middle of college. Right. But right. That, that notion for me of being different, I think that's one path that many people experience, whether you have a visible dimension of difference, such as race or ethnicity or an invisible dimension of difference that, you know, is not so apparent. Disability yeah. being a really good example of that or LGBTQ right. status as another. So I think that's one path that people have. And I also just think there's exposure to differences. There's plenty of folks who I have experienced in my career and my journeys on this planet of folks that you would have thought would have never, never changed their perspective or felt hardwired to be very closed minded. The right circumstances and situations can change that. 
So I think it's a bit of both, Scott. I do think, though, humor me. Let me tell you a story here that may be relevant on that. Sure. Take all the time you want. I think this notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion is challenging right now because a lot of us can think of examples where we are deeply inclusive, and we are, of those people we're inclusive of. (laughs) <laughs> right, 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 right. And so we become legends in our own mind. Yes, yes. Right? So let yes. me tell you, here right. are the examples that uh, prove to you that I'm I'm not homophobic, I'm not transphobic, I'm not racist. Is this a good time to mention my wife is black? <laughs> See, right? <laughs> right, exactly. right, right, right. Exactly. We come up with these proof points and we equate them with like, therefore, I am a good person. I would encourage us and we in our work encourage people to to try to take that judgment away and think critically. And here's the example I'm going to give you. My 40th birthday through a birthday party and it was a fairly large event. Right. So and at this time, I'm the president of a diversity, equity and inclusion consulting firm doing work globally. I'm leading that organization. I'm proud of my commitment to this work. I know and I have the proof points how inclusive I am. There were about 100 people at the party and I had a hand in the guest list. And as the good guest of honor should be, I was fashionably late to the party, right? So everybody else is there and I'm I'm arriving. And I'm excited about this. I'm excited to be 40. I, I think I've wanted to be 40 since I was 12. And so this is a good thing for me. I'm finally here. I walk in full of excitement. And I look at the room and the room that I was standing in is not near the match that I have about how inclusive and diverse I am in my mind. And it was one of those moments, I share it because it was in that moment, it was like hitting a brick wall of realization for me. And it was one of the most pivotal moments of my professional career of, wait a minute, something's not matching. Now, a good part of the room happened to be family and share my skin tone. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But that that's right. my, my broader professional network was largely represented in that room as well. And it really changed my thinking of, wait a minute, what am I really doing? As inclusive as I think I am, as open-minded as I think I am, What am I doing to make sure that that's demonstrated in all aspects of my life? And so flash forward, six years later, my husband and I decided to get married because we could, and we decided to make it big. I remember that night. I was there. All right. Well, then the story may resonate with you as well. (laughs) There's so much about that day and that event that I feel really deeply emotional about Mm -hmm. and proud of and grateful for. But one of the things that I am most grateful for is the number of unsolicited comments from our guests. We had over over 200 people at the wedding who said either during or after, shortly after the event, this is the most diverse wedding I have ever been to. And that was a repeated comment. And I share that not to pat myself on the back, because even though I thought I was inclusive, I opened the door and put myself in situations in that six-year period where I was the only fill in the blank in a lot of rooms. I found new networks to connect with. I challenged myself to go where I thought my perspective would not be valued, quite frankly, to hear and to learn. And that was six years of hard work. But I'm convinced now, you know, now we're 10 years past that 40th birthday, that the success of the firm, the success of our team is in part because of that openness to a broader network and that going on that conscious and deliberate journey to challenge myself and put myself in a lot of uncomfortable situations that I had never been in before. Better for it and my business is better for it. And I see small businesses, entrepreneurs, artists, who there's a, often a gravitational pull towards sameness initially because we go, we go find our community. And I think that's great. But if looking to grow and expand beyond that, it may mean you need to grow and expand outside of your current network. At least I would share, I've benefited immensely from it. So I know that's a long 
long. No, that's it. That, 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 I mean, yeah, no. We, hey, it's a podcast. We got all the time in the world. It's my show. We can go as long as we want. Well, no, that is a. I'm glad you shared that story. Thank you for sharing that story. That's a poignant story on a lot of levels. But it also, of course, it indicates the level of self awareness that you have that a lot of people don't have. And I think, how do you guys help people? become more self-aware and, dare I say, enhance their situational awareness, your situational awareness. I mean, you saw you had a real epiphany in that moment. And, you know, I feel like a lot of times we just sort of just walk with blinders on. We're not open. One of the ways that we do that is we, we ask people to really think about the people who are in your most tightly held professional circle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about everybody you know in the professional world, but think about the people who you really go to when you need career advice. You're not sure if you should take this opportunity or not. Is it a good one or not? Who do you want to bounce those ideas off of? Or you're faced with a deadline or a project that you know you, you can't do on your own. Who do you want sitting at your side or working virtually at your side to pull it off? Who do you go to when you need somebody to tell you about yourself? <laughs> I did or said this thing yesterday. I'm not quite sure how it landed. What do you think? Who do you go to to get that sort of input from? Who do you go to as a thought partner when you're stuck? So think about those people. And so I'm not talking about everybody you interact with, but those, those people who I call them my personal board of directors my most tightly held professional circle. And what we do is we have people actually list those folks and, and think about all the benefits that you're getting and the power of these go-to people and the attributes and traits that they have and the benefits you and they get and your business or your company gets from them. And then we, we have you explore how diverse that network is from you. So what many folks don't know that's coming in that assessment is, yeah, we have you list your people. And then we want to know of those people who is a different race or ethnicity than you, who has a different sexual orientation, who has a different gender or gender identity than you, disability status, military status, family status, communication style, area of expertise. And we actually, we help people look in a quantifiable way how diverse this, this kind of tight circle is. And that does a couple of things. It gives you a proof point to see how inclusive you really are. And it's different. It's different when I say, oh, I work at this charity or I know people who are, but are they in your most tightly held circle? Do you value people enough with these dimensions of difference to take advice from in your career professionally? And that level of interaction and proximity, going back to that earlier concept, Scott, is really powerful and can offer a lot of insight. So you ask how, that's an example of the level of critical thinking that we encourage people to do about who you're surrounding yourselves with. I'm so glad you shared that because, I mean, our listeners could do that at home. I mean, what a great exercise to be able to really audit because you're auditing your life, right? You're auditing and boy, is, can that be telling, right? Well, and then we ask, who are the people who are in your go away network? <laughs> Meaning, who are those people who know that are, yeah. that are in your circles, but they know no matter what, you're never asking their opinion. They know that you're never going to be the one to, to ask them for a help or assistance or guidance or their thoughts or perspectives. You likely have people in your life like that too. And are there common dimensions that they share that can give you insight about your opportunity to grow and push yourself. This conversation is so great. It's stirring up a lot of kind of memories. And <laughs> I had sort of a friend of mine's uh, seat and he asked me to stand up in his wedding. And one of the coolest cultural experiences I've ever had. And again, I'm not, you know, let's, let's be clear. <laughs> I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just telling the story. But a uh, dear friend, and so it was an honor to stand up in his wedding and in the Sikh temple, and his uncle from India wrapped my head in a turban. And it was so cool. And I still have the turban. I saved it. I mean, it's 15 years ago, but it just, it literally was so tied in my head. I just was able to like, it almost just, it was like sucked on there. It was just like, you know, just came like right off the head. But we were in Texas, Houston, and we were coming from the temple to the hotel we thought we'd stop and get some champagne and wine and beer and stuff for the party. And so I go into 
the store dressed in my turban to go get some booze. Now, you know, we've already told our listeners, I'm from Northwest Indiana. I'm a white guy. I was abused in that store because people thought I was Indian mm-hmm. and or Sikh. And it was just a powerful, scary, eye-opening moment of just how vulnerable some people are. Well, and just from a manifestation of, of one garment, of one indicator of difference that people don't expect. And, you know, there are overt acts of exclusion and there are subtle acts of exclusion. It feels like you you had a, a moment of an overt act of exclusion, right? Yeah. I wasn't the only one. I was with a friend who was also in the wedding and he's half German, half Polish. I mean, you can't get wider than this guy. And he was he was also wearing a turban and we went in together and he, you know, we both were ridiculed in this place. So anyway, so it is real. You know, one of the things I want to go back to, because you've said this a couple times, and I want to I want to bring it up because I honestly haven't thought of it. And again, this is part of the reason why I wanted to have you on the show and talk about this stuff, because I also want to learn and grow. Because quite frankly, I hadn't thought of you know military service as being a point of exclusion or discrimination or bias or what have you. And but my God, Boy, is that a, you are so right about that. I, I'm going to oversimplify here, but I mean, half our country has been to war and the other half hasn't. Mm-hmm. Right. And the perceptions and that we have of each other as a result are really powerful. And some things that people don't often think about in this topic are physical size, weight. We have made it socially acceptable to discriminate overtly and subtly based on physical size, beauty. These things show up. It doesn't have to be just the typical, if you will, the big three race, age, gender, right? Or if you add to that sexual orientation and gender identity. But, uh, you know, I don't mean to minimize those. But we, we make it socially acceptable to exclude the other a lot. I think that's worth exploring. Again, not to go into the politically correct arena. Again, I don't think that serves us well, but what do we think when somebody has a a dialect, a Southern dialect, and what goes through our minds and what happens in our interactions? Those things matter and they add up. And and as, as clear, I could tell how clear even you telling that story from 15 years ago, it takes you back to that moment. Imagine if you had those similar experiences, not once in 15 years, but now every 15 days, every 15 minutes, and the cumulative impact of those experiences. Well, listen, I mean, to bring it back home as a dad, as a white father to two kids of color, growing up with my white privilege, as they say, raising my kids in a world where helping them understand, helping them navigate. I mean, those are muscles that I quite frankly don't have. Yeah. Thank God I have my wife who can help fill in those gaps. But yes, I mean, to your point, I mean, people are experiencing this on a daily basis. And quite frankly, I didn't have to. And so my lens is skewed. I have a perhaps a unrealistic expectation. Well, and then the problem is when we ever assume, thank you for sharing that, because I think some of the challenges, we then assume that everybody else needs to have the same experiences we've had. Or that that's normal is normal for us. Well, yeah, I know my lived experience, but I don't know yours. And having the empathy, a word you used earlier, you know, the ability to, I may never know what it's really like to walk in your shoes, but what am I doing to build bridges and have conversations where I can attempt to understand? And again, it goes back to the storytelling and proximity versus, oh, let us just show you this one cognitive model about how you too can be <laughs> more diverse <laughs> and inclusive. I wish it were that simple, but it's about creating human experiences with one another. And when we villainize one another across differences, and right now we're seeing that for some of the most, I'll just use my circles right now. This is a tough time and I'm struggling with this as well. So I don't, this is not me pointing the finger. People with different political beliefs than I do right now in this moment, it's really hard for me to be inclusive with. And if we continue the divide and the villainization of one another, how do we create breakthroughs? How do we create or are we going to create shared experiences and paths forward that are productive? 
spending a lot of time in that space right now. I don't have any answers. So if, if anyone's listening, if you've just perked up and said, okay, great, what's the answer to that? Good, good luck. Not today. Not today, people. Not today. Not today. So, well, then you know, that sort of begs the question a little bit. To what extent has social media helped or hurt our ability to be inclusive? It's a yes and for me. It's There's so much exposure an opportunity to learn about other, and, and it's broadened the world and made the whole entire world accessible on one hand, which is all so much an incredible tool and value for what we're trying to do to build a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive world. So fully supportive. But at the same time, that unfollow button is also equally as powerful. When we start able to confirmation bias and only surround ourselves or hear those voices and perspectives that match our own, when the algorithms keep feeding us the things that we are only inclined to already prefer to see, it removes the opportunity for us to see and experience differences. So the technology is going to be how we use it. Is the technology good or bad? Well, the technology is the technology. It's our usage of it. Are we going to use it to expand our horizons, to expand our views, to take in alternative perspectives so we then grow and make better informed decisions ourselves? Or do we use it as a limiting factor to confirm our point of view to begin with, which we didn't need? I often say, I've got me covered. I've got my point of view covered. My team will tell you the same thing. Yes, he's got, we don't need any more of him. Right. <laughs> I like thinking about what am I gaining and listening to and learning from that's different from my own perspective. We're on chatting about social media a little bit right now, which of course bumps into a little bit of the woke aspect of our conversation earlier, but we haven't yet mentioned cancel culture. And this is an interesting sort of segue into this because boy, this is sort of gang-like mentality of certain folks on the Twitter sphere or what have you to pile on if somebody happens to make an honest mistake, or maybe it's not an honest mistake, maybe they're just an asshole. But I think a lot of times people do make honest mistakes and then they get uh, ridiculed and, and beat up in the social media sphere. You know, where's all this going? I mean, how does Inquest help companies and people navigate this cancel culture that we're a part of? So the complexity behind the question is so profound, right? It sounds on the surface as as something just so simple, right? Of Is it good or bad? Or I think it's just another nuance that we've got to find ways to navigate. This notion of holding one another accountable for what we do and say, incredibly powerful. And we would support that. We want, especially our leaders, our public figures, those who are in positions of power, being able, there's there's a different level of responsibility when you go on platforms like that, that we want the accountability for, not again to support like, a, you know, the PC movement, but words matter, words matter, actions, behaviors matter. But when we go so far as to to take the culture to a place of Let me show you how disrespectful you were by being disrespectful to you. I think we've lost something. When we treat intolerance with intolerance, when we treat prejudice with prejudice, I I have to question how effective are we going to be at coming out on the other side versus creating opportunities for shared learning, shared understanding, where we often say in our work, This is not about being perfect. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to say something that offends. You're going to say something that is viewed by someone or some group as inappropriate. Do you have a culture where you can get that feedback and correct on your own versus this notion of culture of you have to be beat up to correct? That's my point of view on that. I think we've got work to do. Right. Yeah, these tools have been, and these platforms and these technologies have been 
released and unleashed on us with and you know with no user manual really it's so we never did a double blind study to see whether or not they were dangerous to the health and well-being of society and so we're learning as we go and it is to your point i mean there are obviously many beautiful things about it and many horrific things about it and i hope we're able to figure out how to navigate in a way that ends up being a net positive versus a, a net neutral or a net negative. But that also bumps into this bigger idea of how are we doing? In other words, the progress, what progress have we made? Are we better off today? All things being equal, are we better off today than we were 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago? My unequivocal answer is yes. That as difficult as this moment is and as painful and horrific as these moments are, the opportunity we have to see and bend the arc, if you will, as a result of this current reality that we're in, I think is strong. And I view that as positive. I'm an optimist that way, though. So that's my bias. That's my general orientation. The fact that we're having conversations around race and racism and systemic and institutionalized racism, for example, in organizations and companies in the country and the world differently today is an opportunity that I think is progress. Where the challenge is to think that these are brand new conversations. These aren't new situations. These aren't new topics. These have been, you know, this, is, this has gone on for a long time. But the opportunity, responsibility, and obligation that we have to sustain conversations and explore new ways to address them, I do think that's progress. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've had lots of conversations in you know, recent months and years with folks, certainly after Hillary Clinton lost the election, and I voted for Hillary Clinton. But you know, those first few weeks and months of Trump's presidency, you know, many of my liberal friends were beside themselves, oh, the sky's falling, you know, it's the end of the world as we know it and what have you. And I found myself almost sounding like a Trump supporter because I said, guys, it's been worse. The sky isn't falling. Whether you were black in the South in the 50s or 60s, or whether you were Jewish in Europe in the 30s and 40s, or if you were gay and you loved a woman or man and couldn't get married, there's so much progress here. We're so, you know, and not that it can't get worse, not that things can't happen. You have to be vigilant. You have to be engaged and involved. We get the democracy that we make, not the one we deserve. So you have to be on it. But I'm with you. I have hope. I err on the side of hope. I see progress on so many metrics. But the word you, you used is, is an important one. We, we've got to stay vigilant and we can't let up on the conversations. I'm struck by, and I'm going to use this as an example, and in some circles it may be a provocative one, but do you remember that little thing called hashtag me too? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we solved that problem, right? It went away. I don't want, we clearly haven't, obviously, but our attention span diverted from that pretty quickly. And in some ways, I would argue appropriately so with the event of 2020 and the, the disparities of the healthcare disparities from a racial perspective regarding impact of COVID are just outrageous and unacceptable and intolerable. The string of murders and the impact on our African-American community in particular, just tragic and horrific. And we must not let ourselves get complacent where these things become, we're desensitized to them or we become numb to them. That is a bit of a, a worry and a fear. And I think we have to stay on it. We have to keep having these conversations. And we need, we need people across all racial groups to have and engage in these conversations. I carry a responsibility as a white male doing this work. I'm very clear about owning that part of my identity. That does that mean I speak for or shouldn't give room and space for my black colleagues doing this work? No, we do. And frequently, it's important. It's going to take all of us to continue to make progress and stay on it. Yeah. How old is the inclusion consulting industry? When did inclusion or, or inclusive consulting, when did that become a thing? Well, it's relatively new in the scheme of things. Many would argue that some of the early work was born out of the 60s civil rights movement 
and, and then Title VII coming after that. So that's where the some of the early compliance-based work comes in. But then really taking off in the late 80s with some of your listeners, they may, if they were in a workplace that did sensitivity training, that was kind of some of the early variations to this work and resulted in the office doing some really good parodies of some of the <laughs> uh, uh, diversity training that uh, had gone on. It's relatively young as a field, if you will. And the concepts now have evolved quickly to what used to be just diversity. Then we added diversity and inclusion. And then we started hearing words like belonging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now the trend is leaning really hard and appropriately from our view into this notion of equity. It continues to evolve, but relatively new to your question. So to what extent can government actually help? I mean, you know, some people feel like you can't legislate or regulate values and morality and ethics. And of course we do and we try and, you know, murder should be illegal. <laughs> but when it comes to some of these more, dare I say, nuanced or cultural issues, to what extent, I mean, what role should or shouldn't government play? So... I want to be transparent that that's an area of question that I feel not as equipped to answer. My frame is more in the corporate organizational societal perspective versus policy. There are folks who do this work that I'm in and in the field who are policy experts in that way and have really strong points of view. So that's a, my disclaimer. But I do think there is a role. I think where that line is, I don't think we've found yet, but I think there's certainly a role for government and legislation to play. I think we see examples across the globe that work well and where it doesn't. We can look at some of that research. We can look at some of that data. And I think we've got work to do. I think that one of the major roles that I will say is government and legislators, the people who are leading those efforts, modeling some of the behavior that we're after. I'd like that to- would be a nice start. I'd like to start there. Yeah. Yeah. And I hear you and I agree with you. And what I love about the work that you do is that really you are equipping my assessment, my words, not yours, but you're equipping people, you're giving people the tools and the knowledge and some techniques maybe for them to make change in their immediate lives and communities. And it's, it's a ground up grassroots kind of approach. And, and I love that because it can't just be one or the other, right? It can't just be government. It's got to be bottom up too, but people need to feel empowered and they need to feel informed. And that's the work that you do. Yes. Thank you for that, because it, we're proud of that. And we don't have it figured out yet either, right? It's not like there's a magic bullet for that. You know, I think part of the reason why we have such divide right now is, you know, you've got to, and, and this is what I'm getting ready to say, has been said before by folks who are far smarter than I am, that there is a significant portion of our population in this country that has felt disenfranchised and left behind, that felt like things like when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion means talking about everybody but them, that feels like this is about other. I go back to, I think we've done a disservice if that's the message that we've sent intentionally or unintentionally. And how do we how do we build a space of this inclusion tent where there's room for all of us, truly, not just in not just in words and in slogans, right. but in, in reality? No, I agree. And when Trump won, so many of my West Coast liberal friends were shocked. They were, of course, horrified, but they were shocked. They were surprised. And as we've already said, we're from the Midwest. Uh, my parents live in Northwest Indiana. I had traveled back to Chicago. I, I come back home often. I had seen the Trump signs. And a lot of the people that feel disenfranchised are the parents and grandparents and even the kids I grew up with and their parents and grandparents. So I was disappointed that my girl didn't win, but I was not surprised that Trump won because I had seen the signs and I knew that he was selling something that they really needed and they really wanted, which was hope and opportunity. And of course, it turns out snake oil salesmen are as American as apple pie. But the point is, is that I told my very well-intentioned, lovely liberal friends that you missed it because, of course, you refer to those states as the flyover states as you go from LA to New York. And I actually went, you know, go back home and I could see it. And so, but it's this 
getting to your point, it's like we have to figure out how we start talking to each other, seeing each other, hearing each other. And there has to be a willingness on both sides. I think this is where it gets tricky. I think there's an obligation for us to do that as a collective. And I think that's our biggest challenge right now. I think we've got a really big challenge to be able to do that on both sides, willingness and openness. And I say that, and I know a lot of listeners may be hearing that. They're going to hear that and interpret that as the challenge being, oh, well, I've got to get my conservative. The conservative side has to be open-minded. Some of the most closed-minded folks that I encounter on these topics are our liberal colleagues and partners and friends. Are uh, yes, yes. And again, it goes back to: Are we inclusive with some of the people some of the time, or are we inclusive? Period. And I will tell you, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm navigating relationships in my personal sphere, family, and friends that have been challenging of late because I don't, I'm, you know, figuring out how to navigate it, but navigate it, we must. Yes, we must. And you said something earlier about how we used to be in terms of impolite to talk about religion or politics. I have a dear friend, first generation Italian American from Chicago, his you know family immigrated from Italy and they have done very well in business in Chicago. And I love my friend to death, huge Trump supporter, huge Trump supporter. And he and I tease each other all the time. But at the end of the day, I was interested. He said, you know, we, we kind of just need to get back to a point where maybe we don't talk about these things so publicly, because if we see each other on a human level as friends, you share a common humanity, you laugh, you tease, you love. And, you know, I don't know if you put that genie back in the bottle or not. But the other challenge, I think, is that it's really interesting, you know, what you said, though, about that, because voting your interest is as American as it gets. I don't blame my countrymen for a casting a vote. I do take issue with them demonizing the other side for voting differently. And so, I, you know, I don't know how we change that or fix that, but certainly the work that you do helps to address that. How much do politics come up in your workshops? I'm curious. Increasingly. I mentioned earlier, I've been doing this for 23 years. I would say for the first, you know, certainly the first 15 to 18, rarely, if never, it just wasn't there. Increasingly, they, though, now. Uh, and I think there's a bit of corporations are at the very top of the house talking about politics differently. There's a different view of corporate social responsibility. There is a talent attraction angle that's really important here about modeling inclusion, much, much more. Yeah. It's not just politics. Politics and religion are two emerging areas that we we need to find ways to explore. How do we maintain civil discourse across differences? How do we disagree on policy? How do we disagree on actions without villainizing one another? and still have civil discourse that's productive. It's clear we've lost some of that. You mentioned earlier about how close-minded, you know, liberals can be sometimes. Certainly the far left, there is this Tea Party-like element, right? I mean, it's this purity kind of police. If you're not PC enough or woke enough, then there's a problem. I had a personal sort of experience that was, was, I think, illustrates this a little bit. A friend of mine, keyboardist, piano player, And he's toured with Madonna uh, on her last several tours. And so Madonna was playing the Chicago Theater last October, I guess it was. And so I flew in to go see my friend play with Madonna. So I was at the Chicago Theater with with another friend. And I ended up in the line at the bathroom. And uh, you're probably familiar with the Chicago Theater. There's a couple of... uh, you know, not a, not many bathrooms. It was a packed house for Madonna. I was probably one of the few straight people there. And in the bathroom, in the line for the bathroom, I was probably the only straight person in line at the bathroom. There were, I'm guessing, several trans, several you know, lesbians, several, you know, whatever. And I'm standing there and we're sort of all chit-chatting a little bit and just waiting for our turn because it's like one at a time in this bathroom. And the sign on the bathroom was, you know, had this sort of iconography 
uh, this very PC iconography where it had every little stick figure, right? <laughs> every little stick figure of any permutation of gender that you might uh, imagine. And then it said bathroom. And so I guess I'd had one drink too many. I, I don't know. But I, I saw the sign and I just said, hey, and everybody sort of looks at me and I point to the sign. I say, can it just say bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> they all cra- they were like yes you yes you uh, yeah, preach it <laughs> you know what I mean? like you know, speak the truth speak the truth and it was just this uh, moment of like humanity where it's just like no we just want to sometimes the zealots i guess ruin the party is the point <laughs> yes and it's a yes and right, right, right a lot right. of times the zealots is use that term, are some of the times the people who drive our awareness that there's a problem in the first place. They're the trailblazers. Right. But then it's at what point do we transfer that or do we, I think, navigate some of that early energy that's often required to get people's attention and that there's a real purpose that some of those folks serve. But at what point then does it shut people down? Yes. Scott Hoseman, I'll tell you, I am so grateful for our friendship. We've known each other 35 years uh, or more now. The fact that we can come together and talk about these important issues after all these years of friendship, it's an honor and a gift. And keep up the great work. Keep up everything you're doing. You are a good case for cloning, my friend. We need to figure out how to make more of you because there's a lot of work to be done. There is. And thank you, Scott, for the invite and all of the work that you're doing to spread a positive message and to make sure that you're doing your part to to kind of spread that positivity, I think, is really powerful. So thank you. Value you, the family and all the best as we go into this holiday season. Indeed. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Please give your beloved Joe my regards. We will see you on the other side, my friend. All right. Thank you, Scott. Cheers. Bye bye. Hey there, thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review, and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at NotRealArtWorld. If you're an artist, be sure to apply for our 2021 artist grant at NotRealArt.com. Sourdough, out. 